exhaustion, and perf- if you have one or any of these, then you are very much defined as being on the spectrum of burnout. Science and technology is not a fair game. We may very well be defined by burnout as a profession. Most scientists love what they do, but rising levels of work-related stress have left job satisfaction at an all-time low. I don't think any of us, any scientists, can escape burnout. My plan for avoiding burnout in 2024 is to do even more work, finding my ikigai. The thoughts expressed in this podcast are my own views and opinions that do not reflect the values of my employers. Welcome back to the newly rebranded Biolab Collective with Jack Wayne podcast. For those of you who are old listeners, it was previously named Cross Over Connections and the reasons for this rebrand I'll touch back on at the end of this episode, but it ties very much in today's episode theme, which is all around the burnout. If it's your first time to the podcast, my name is Jack Wayne. I'm a scientist, YouTuber and podcaster. And on this podcast, we cover the business of science and how all the headlines inform us about the jobs of the future. Usually as the year ends, all of us feel very drained from everything that's happened that year. And what you don't want is to have the lingering effects of burnout from the previous year carry over into the next year. And it has this negative flow on effect, this vicious cycle as opposed to a virtuous cycle. And before you know it, you start the new year more cynical, more negative than ever before. And scientists are certainly not immune to burnout. In fact, we may very well be defined by burnout as a profession. And the first headline comes courtesy of an article from Nature, which talks about a concept known as John Henryism. John Henry literally worked himself to death. And in the STEM workforce, science tends to attract people who want to get to the bottom of very important questions. And this hustle culture, this dogged pursuit of the truth or objective measure of innovation, this is what defines many scientists and inspires them to get into the field in the first place. It's very difficult to separate out that hero worship culture of that go get them, never stop until you get to the finish line. And the finish line is very illusory because innovation never stops. This kind of mentality is very pervasive within the STEM workforces. Naturally, burnout is going to happen. Nature does this career survey across the STEM workforce to check for people's relative satisfaction and their triggers and if they feel fulfilled by their work. And according to this article, which was a little while ago in 2021, less than 60% of respondents to the salary and job satisfaction survey reported being satisfied with their positions. This mark of job satisfaction is at an all-time low for as long as this server has been running and that's obviously a worrying sign for the future of the STEM workforce. Why is that the case? Well, first of all, the parallels between academia and industry as it relates to satisfaction according to the survey is pretty similar. Neither is particularly rosy, feeling like I'm achieving less than I should, feel like there's more work to do, feel like I don't have enough time, feeling run down, drained, feeling like organizational politics or bureaucracy prevent them from doing a good job. The science, the actual work of investigative inquiry is only part of the job, if not half of the job. Reviewing papers, reviewing for journals, sitting on grant panels, or for free, as well as the committee work if you are employed at a university or college. This pretty much means people who work in STEM often have the equivalent workload of two full-time jobs. If this is all so terrible and the situation is so dire, why are there still so many people in our field of science and so many people wanting to get into the fields of science? It is because fundamentally we have that intellectual curiosity. We love the idea of being at the forefront of finding something brand new that we can put our name on. We're enchanted by the fantasy of our legacy in the history books and there will always be a line of people trying to get into this space and I really like this editorial article from Immunology Journal. One of the editors wrote an article about burnout in science, becoming their own independent lab head, their own independent principal investigator, having a reliable source of grant funding, having lots of people under their purview, sitting on all these important advisory boards and starting companies, while also having kids and trying to balance a family life. What happened at the end was that despite having an embarrassment of professional riches and all of these accolades, they felt like they were unable to climb out of bed in the morning, they were burnt out. And science burnout is a little unique in that we felt this immense internal pressure to live up to some imaginary standard. We need to always work harder and try and find an extra edge. We're essentially battling against ourselves or the illusion that everyone else is a step ahead of us. The imposter syndrome, of course, plays a little bit of a role in this. All the things that we do, many of the things that we strive for, they are internal, intrinsic pressures that we place upon ourselves. Many scientists are explorers by nature. We do this job because it is our chance to discover something and that quest of discovery 
discovery really gets ourselves into trouble. Our work, our passion for discovery or modeling or solving a problem is never finished. We have to be kind to ourselves to be ready to put our tools down at the end of the day and rest, recuperate, and potentially socialize. Now, I'm a microbiologist. I'm not an organizational psychologist. So until this point, despite seeing the headlines and reading some articles, I didn't really have an academic perspective of what burnout actually is. The Maslach Burnout Inventory or the MBI comes up again, again, and again for different professions. You have to adapt the questions for different sets and retest and validate. So for instance, there are some versions of the instrument specifically for medical personnel with one example being, I don't really care what happens to some patients. Burnout is predominantly defined by three main components, exhaustion, cynicism, and professional inefficacy. Exhaustion, feeling of being overextended and depleted of your emotional and physical resources. Check. Cynicism refers to a negative, hostile, or excessively detached response to the job, which often includes a loss of idealism. Check. Professional inefficacy refers to a decline in feelings of competence and productivity at work and people experience a growing sense of inadequacy about their ability to do the job well and may result in a self-imposed verdict of failure. Check as well. Exhaustion, cynicism and professional inefficacy. If you have one or any of these, then you are very much defined as being on the spectrum of burnout. And again, these are the world leading experts on the phenomenon of burnout and they've found six factors that systematically contribute to burnout happening in people who work for those institutions. Workload is number one. Both qualitative and quantitative workload contribute to burnout, depleting the capacity of people to meet the demands of the job. In science, we're never gonna escape this. The workload is going to be always present. And again, I talked about it, much of that workload is self-imposed because we're racing against the clock, we're competing against the world and driving innovation, bringing it to market, being the first to do so. The workload is always going to be there. We can't escape it. We are sitting ducks. Control is the second factor that leads to burnout or more specifically, a lack of control or a feeling that you don't have control. Researchers have identified a clear link between a lack of control and high levels of stress and burnout. Sadly, in science, nothing is ever in our control really. Grant funding is not entirely in our control. Whether our papers get accepted by journals is again, not really in our control. Experiment after experiment, paper after rejected paper, all of this loss of control starts to add up. Reward is the next factor that likely leads to burnout. Insufficient recognition and reward increases people's vulnerability to burnout. This is one that I think we could choose to fix because we have to just take it on face value that the reward is almost never going to be financial. Hopefully, some extrinsic measures of reward from your immediate supervisor or your supervisor, supervisor, or if your discovery is big enough, your institution, hopefully has some press release, has some local awards that you can apply for, finding reward intrinsically. This could be one way that we separate ourselves from the risk of burnout. The next factor is community. Community the ongoing relationship that employees have with other people in the job, when these relationships are fractured, a lack of support, no trust, unresolved conflict, there is greater risk of burnout. That does not mean it has to be this way in science. Unfortunately, I've heard many stories where it is like this, where students and postdocs in the same lab are competing to make the same discovery. That sense of suspiciousness, of lack of trust, of broken, fractured professional relationships, that comes from the top, that comes from the supervisor and how they set their students and their staff and their postdocs up for healthy competition, but ultimately success. This sense of community can also be a more grassroots thing. And I think it's important for more junior staff to organize social events. If it's up to the most senior member of staff to organize the Christmas party, then it gets the sense of forced fun. Right? When you invite your boss to your Christmas party, unless your boss is the coolest person in the world, still there's this inherent power imbalance and they're the ones organizing the social events rather than just being a guest. It will feel very forced and that sense of community might breed further suspicions and further sense of isolation and alienation. Fairness, I'll just strike this one off the board straight away. Science and technology is not a fair game. The people who work the hardest, who are the smartest and the brightest, aren't always the ones who make the breakthrough and get the full reward. History is littered with many scientists who were this close to making the pivotal discovery, but 
through the work of their collaborator or someone who saw what they were working on but had the ingenuity to take it a step further, they were able to capitalize and win all the big awards. Fairness is not the name of the game. It will not be the thing that prevents us from experiencing burnout. But a stopgap to prevent that from happening has to be your values. If the outcome is not what we can control, if the ultimate recognition is not something that's within the individual's grasp. Within their organization, your values have to protect the individuals from that inevitable outcome. You cannot control if a discovery actually makes it to market, but your organization has to have the set of values to really support people, support individuals, if the outcome isn't really what it should be and the values of respect, inclusivity, this is something that we can divorce from the ultimate outcome, which unfortunately in science and tech is all too often not particularly fair. So I haven't painted a particularly positive picture of burnout in science and indeed almost all the scientists I know have had burnout at one point or another during their whole careers, if not during this current calendar year. The one thing that is not particularly helpful, I have to say, you gotta relax more. Why aren't you feeling relaxed? You gotta relax. You need to take some time off and relax. Why aren't you relaxed? Are you relaxed yet? Nothing less relaxing than being forcefully told you have to relax. This sentiment is reflected in this article from Forbes. The negative impact of toxic positivity in the workplace. When people cannot be their full negative selves, when you can't give the impression of being a little bit down and everyone is forced to be upbeat, forced to be positive, that also has this long lingering negativity, maybe not quite toxicity, but certainly can't be helpful if you have to be very happy every day by force because your boss tells you you need to be happy. Corporate sponsored toxic positivity is the belief that employees must focus on positive emotions and disavow negative feelings in the workplace. A toxic positivity agenda calls for being enthusiastic and upbeat despite the dire situation. There's a fine line there, isn't it? You can embed a culture where, hey, the negative things will happen. Let's support each other and find ways to collectively arrive at a place where it's okay to not be okay. As opposed to if you come in showing any vulnerability to work and you come in a little down, go home. Don't bring that negative energy into the office. Everyone has to be very positive all the time. That has its toll on people. It can have this lingering effect and burden and ultimately lead to burnout, which won't let you bounce back and just pretend to be happy that easily. It's this insidious effect on people's mood and motivations over an extended period of time. Again, if you dive into the academic literature about how people should be addressing burnout, given that burnout is an association and is caused by the workplace, let's try and fix what's happening in the workplace and make the root causes of workplace culture a little bit more positive so that they don't lend themselves to burnout across the board. This article linked in the show notes talks about different types of burnout interventions. If you look across the burnout literature, you can see that those promoted by the organization include things like improving workstations, humanization of work schedules, I like that wording, humanization of things like work-life balance plans, as well as leadership development, and courses in leadership for managers in how to promote a positive work culture, not to mention the use of non-financial rewards and incentives. I've been involved in quite a few professional development days for people like fundraisers or teachers and just having that community recognition of, hey, here is a reward for the best teacher or the best tutor or the best fundraiser or the best community engagement person. Those non-monetary awards, not on a big scale anyway, they can really raise morale at least for the short term. I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, that the majority of my audience are individual employees, right? That you somehow feel under the thumb of the big system or the big organization you work in, or maybe you haven't been able to progress in your career as quickly as you'd like. I always like to focus on the strategies that individual employees can take to protect ourselves in the long run, including physical exercise, mindfulness training, as well as psychotherapy. But the one that matters the most to me is self-assessment. That is the category of burnout prevention that's impacted me most personally. And the resource that's the most public facing and quite useful, not too filled with jargon, comes courtesy of the Black Dog Institute in Australia and their four-step self-care plan, defining what self-care actually is, the activities and practices that we deliberately choose to engage in regularly to maintain and enhance our health and well-being, especially as it relates to stress, anxiety, which snowballs ultimately into something like burnout. And it has four steps. I think step one is the most important and also the hardest to do. Step one is to evaluate 
your coping skills and your current habits when stress gets to you. What do you do when you feel stressed? How do you currently manage? Do you think your management and coping strategy is a positive habit that will let you cope better over time? Or is it a negative strategy that will actually ding and deteriorate your health over time so that as more stress comes along, as you continue to cope, you're actually getting worse and worse at the thing that you should be getting better and better at. Some examples of positive coping strategies, deep breathing, sounds simple enough, listening to music, exercising, meditation, reading, connecting with others, and engaging in a hobby. Out of all of those, I probably do all of them except connecting with others and engaging in a hobby regularly. I do tend to self-isolate a little bit when the going gets tough. I just like to hunker down and get my work done and often that doesn't leave much time for connecting with other people. So I need to be more deliberate in putting that strategy into place, certainly at the end of the year, certainly for the start of 2024 and engaging in a hobby. One of the key tent poles for how I'm planning on fixing my burnout in 2024 and hopefully going into the future. I'll come back to this point later on. The negative coping mechanisms, yelling, I'm not a big yeller. Smoking, not a smoker. Pacing, I do tend to pace. Skipping meals, I do skip some meals. Drinking alcohol to excess, I'm not a drinker, so that's not the one for me. Withdraw from friends and family or biting your fingernails. I don't really bite my fingernails, but the thing that really gets me is lose out on sleep is how I cope. I either don't sleep because I'm too stressed or I just work until very, very late. So I don't get as much sleep or don't have as much bandwidth for sleep. That is very much a negative coping strategy and something that I'm hoping to improve in the new year. Looking at all of these mechanisms, you should write down, hopefully journaling is part of a positive habit you can do along with meditation and really identify what are the negative habits that you do when you get stressed and the positive habits that you may sometimes do when you're stressed and lean in and focus on the positive ones and try and cut down on the negative coping strategies. And that leads to step two, which is identifying your daily self-care needs, what you value and what you need in your everyday life. And then once you do this, once you put a template into place, once you put a first draft of a self-care plan, it is by no means binding. That's the other thing. It's not a contract. Also, there's no guarantee that you'll stick to it. Step three is you have to reflect, examine, and replace. Once you have this sense of the habits that are positive in your coping mechanisms for stress and anxiety, you have to constantly go back and reflect, examine, and replace to really refine your self-care plan over time. And step four is to then, once you've reflected over a period of time, see what's working, and then you actually put your self-care plan to play it wasn't until I wrote all of this down that I realized, man, none of this lines up from the outside looking in. It seems like I'm doing a lot of things, but it's not really clear why I'm doing all of them. And this is the reason that I'm rebranding the podcast. Originally, it was the Crossover Connections with Jack Wayne podcast. I knew that I was interested in lots of different things, so I want to find the connections between different themes and different headlines. BioLab Collective with Jack Wayne on YouTube podcast, as well as Substack, that lets me communicate a very clear brand, a very clear message, also lets me mentally configure what it is that I do and why I'm doing all of this, because at the end of the day, that is my ikigai, Venn diagram of what we love to do, what we are good at, what the world needs, and what you can be paid for, because you can't just do this out of the goodness of your own heart, you do need to pay the bills. What I love to do is to mentor people is to mentor young professionals, students, as well as mid to late career professionals. This is also what the world needs. Out of all of those four overlapping circles in the Ikigai Venn diagram, the hardest one to fill is what the world is willing to pay for. My content strategy for 2024 is going to be this. Every week, every Monday, I'm going to release a podcast episode on the latest science and technology headlines. You can follow in whichever way suits you best, whether it be via the YouTube channel, podcast through Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Google Podcasts, and my Substack newsletter, Biolab Collective with Jack Wayne on Substack. And that content is completely free. There's going to be additional content I'm planning for next year that's a lot more direct in helping people apply for jobs. I'm going to be looking through live live job listings, mostly based in Australia around both entry level as well as mid-career or advanced high level managerial roles in science and technology and talk through the strategy I would use to put together a CV, apply for using online forms, if there are any selection criteria, how you 
would be able to meet it. With job applications, timeliness is everything. So I'm gonna reserve that content for people who really want it, people who have paid to subscribe either via my Substack newsletter, by Lab Collective, or via the YouTube membership scheme. And you will get that content straight to you looking at the latest job adverts in science and technology and my strategy to apply for them at different levels of career progression. After every month, I will do a roundup of all these job opportunities and make that freely available. So yes, you lose the timeliness of it. So you won't necessarily be able to apply for those jobs with my strategy in mind. When the job opening is still open, that's reserved for people who pay for a subscription either via Substack or for a membership on YouTube. Applying for jobs is a very personal thing because your employability is based upon your own past experiences, not mine, but I'm hoping to give a fair amount of my own advice over the last 20 years of figuring this out and talking to lots of different people in different professions in science and technology and hopefully allow me to get some outside assistance to edit some of these videos, to compile some of my content online and make everything that much more sustainable so that my ikigai, what I love doing, what I'm good at, what the world needs and really what the world is willing to pay for, fulfill all of those circles and allow me to keep doing what I love. It is my purpose, my reason for being to help people really reach their full potential. The strategy I use that's positive in coping with stress and anxiety is engaging in a hobby and my favorite hobby by far by a mile is photography. But I haven't really had time to do photography because there's never been a deadline around it. It's never that urgent. So when the going gets tough, when there's too many things due, I just put it on the back burner. I don't bother about it. My approach going forward is to dedicate time to go out and take photos every single week. And that is how I will protect my mental health and prevent burnout. And the only way I know how to do this to make sure a habit sticks is to put in deadlines. And what I've decided to do, maybe stupidly, is to start a second YouTube channel. On top of BioLab Collective with Jack Wayne, I'm gonna start a second YouTube channel, Bode Care Therapy with Jack Wayne, all around the intersections between photography and mental health and how I use photography to manage and benefit my mental health. My Instagram, Bode Care Therapy on Instagram. This was gonna be Bode Care Therapy on YouTube. We can see some of the photos I, I've taken over the years. Hopefully you get a sense of my visual aesthetic and, and the style of, of the photos that I like to take and I like to look at. This is my strategy for forcing myself to participate in a positive habit that will protect my mental health. Even though it means I've got more deadlines, that deadline will reinforce my positive virtuous habit that will accumulate over time. Consider subscribing to me on any of these platforms, but certainly if you're interested in my job hunting series, please sign on to a job website of your choice in Australia that is Seek. And if you sign up for a Seek profile, you can pre-populate it with your CV and that will allow you to speed up applying for these jobs. And some of the portals and some of the templates and applications I will walk you through in that Job Hunter series will be a little easier to wrap your head around. Again, you can find me on all of these platforms at BioLab Collective, whether it be YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Podcasts, as well as on Substack, BioLab Collective with Jack Wang. It's gonna be one more podcast episode to round out 2023, and that's gonna be me revisiting all the biggest science headlines of the year and what's happened in those headlines since we first covered them. If you're interested in that episode, revisiting the biggest science headlines of 2023, you can find a link here or in the show notes below. My name is Jack. Connect with you again in the next episode.